Today I am talking to Professor Peter Singer. Professor Peter Singer is an alumnus of Oxford University, but he's also taught at universities around the world, in Australia, here in Oxford, and most recently at Princeton University in the United States. He is a philosopher and well known as such, but he's not simply a philosopher of abstruse questions. He is a philosopher who has applied philosophy to some of the most important questions facing humanity today. And those include questions in relation to what is happening as a consequence of the huge advances in medical research. And so, Peter, I'd like to start by taking you on to that area where you've made enormous contributions to the big questions that face us now that we've sequenced the human genome, understand much better how the physiology of the body works. Um, what led you into taking an interest in those specific kinds of questions? I suppose I had always been interested in ethical questions that have some application to the world. And uh, at the time when I was doing philosophy, it seemed that the discussion of issues in bioethics was, was fairly naive. I mean, there weren't really people working in that area. There would be eminent doctors who would make statements about it, but um, they were often just reflecting what they'd been taught as uh, by their own teachers without too much thought, um, sometimes repeating what were really tried platitudes. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, whenever there was some new development, and the most dramatic one was uh, development of in vitro fertilization uh, with Steptoe and Edwards' work in this country, uh, soon followed up by uh, Wood and Transon in Australia, um, then the press would go to theologians who would put particular views from their religion. But um, you know, we are not a confessional society. I think uh, it was important to have a non-religious voice uh, adding to that discussion. And I thought that this was a role that philosophers could play because we're used to handling moral concepts and moral ideas. And uh, why not become involved in that area as well? So you're somebody who thinks that the methods of philosophical thinking contribute something to these discussions which goes beyond what the scientists themselves were dealing with. Absolutely. I mean, I think the scientists uh, tell us about the facts, which are essential if we're going to continue the discussion, carry it forward. But you can't draw normative conclusions from the facts. I think that's something philosophers... Conclusions about what one should be doing. Exactly. Yes. Conclusions about what we ought to do. So, I mean, people sometimes talk about the technological imperative that, uh, you know, you have machines so you can keep patients alive longer. But most of us recognize now, and we're already starting to question even then, whether you always should keep someone alive longer if their quality of life has fallen below uh, a certain point. So that's why we need to have those, those ethical discussions. And uh, as I say, some of the things that uh, the doctors were, were saying and doing were not really going very deeply into those questions. Yes. Would you say that we could arrive, as it were, at right answers to such questions? Take the one you've just taken, which is how long do you keep somebody alive when most of their physiological functions have ceased operating properly? And the person themselves may be saying, I just don't want to go on. Right. Um, is there a correct answer to that? Is that the way to look at it? Or is it that there should be discussion? Um, is it um, I do believe that there is a correct answer to that, although to demonstrate that is a, a major effort in philosophy. A lot, of, yes. a lot of books have been written about whether there are really objectively right answers or whether yes. it's all a matter of subjective opinion. Um, I take the side that there are right answers. Right. Um, and in particular, in the case you mentioned, where you have a competent adult, I think the right answer is that that person should be able to decide uh, about their own life. Yes. Uh -huh. So, in a sense, you are saying there should be discussion because what you're saying is there isn't a there isn't a correct answer that comes from the science of what we know about the human. That's being, right. Yes. But um, there might be a correct answer which is in connection with what that person thinks, feels, and wishes. Absolutely. Yes. And and there is a difference between ethics and and the sciences in that obviously in some of the sciences, uh, particle physics, say. Um, 
the lay opinion is not worth very much. The experts really yes. know uh, what, what the answers might be. Um, in the case of, of ethics, I think there is some degree of expertise in terms of what philosophers have, that is familiarity with the concepts and how they work, familiarity with different arguments, but um, the role of the layperson is much more significant. They do have yes. to be brought into the discussion yes. and uh, we have to work with the views that they have um, and perhaps clarify them and strengthen the arguments in various ways, but not simply say, well, you don't have a role in this because uh, we're the experts and we know what to do. Which was, of course, at one time a strong opinion in the medical world. Uh, I can remember uh, the days when a patient was not even told what their major problem was. Yes. It was thought, as it were, correct. That's right. <laughs> to not tell somebody that they had gastric cancer, for example. Yes. Uh, so they were led to what well, they were told they had a laparotomy. Right. <laughs> Which just means that people entered the gut and looked at it. Yes. Um, now, you would say that that was an incorrect attitude to the patients as individuals, I take it? Yes, I think, I think medicine was uh, too paternalistic in those, day, uh, in those days. There was the attitude that uh, the doctor knows best, yeah. and the doctor knows best not only the actual medical science side of it, but the doctor knows best what is in the interest of the patient. Yes. Um, and very often the doctor doesn't, um, because the patient is the one who decides what his or her priorities are, what kind of quality is li of life is acceptable and, and for how long, for instance, is really a patient's decision. So what you're advocating in a nutshell is a more human approach to, to medicine, essentially. I That's think so. I, th yes. I, think, um, I think medicine should be focused on what is in the patient's best interests and uh, it shouldn't automatically assume that uh, continued life at all costs is what's in the patient's best interest. And I think that is quite widely recognised in most countries, not everywhere in the world, right. but I think there has been a lot of progress in that direction. There's one final question that I'd like to um, push you on, Peter, which is post doing the human genome, what is it now, 13 years ago since that great announcement in the year 2000 with fanfares on both sides of the Atlantic, Bill Clinton over there, <laughs> Tony Blair here. Um, we are 13 years on, we were promised in about 10 years time from when the human genome was sequenced that we would understand diabetes, we would understand um, problems of mental illness, we would... Now, the answer is that with nearly all of those, we haven't arrived at that. Mm -hmm. Do you as a philosopher think that biologists misunderstood the philosophy of what they were doing? I'm not sure that if they misunderstood the philosophy, I mean, it may have been that they oversold the enterprise that yes. they're engaged in, which of yes. course they're wanting to raise money on. Yeah. Um, and that's quite a common phenomenon in a, a number of different yes. areas. Uh, and, you know, perhaps in general, um, the way things work in the human body appear to be more complicated than even the scientists who study it uh, at first think. Yes. Yes, I, I, I certainly think that that is true. I am a scientist myself, of course. I know, a biological yes, scientist. yes, yes, yes. I, I, I certainly think that. So when it comes to uh, applying philosophy to scientific questions, you see, I think, uh, at least two ways in which philosophy can be useful. One is, as you've demonstrated, with the big ethical questions that arise, how long you keep somebody alive, whether or not somebody should achieve getting a baby this way or that way, right. um, which are very practical questions that people have to deal with. The other kind of way in which philosophy can be useful is to analyze perhaps the way in which scientists present what they think they found. Is that a correct way to put it? Yes, I think that's true. I think that, um the presentation of, of conclusions um, can be a, a transition. You know, you know, scientists are often very narrow um, yes. in their discipline and yes. um, present, presenting the significance of their findings um, is something sometimes that stretches them, that they feel they have to do because it's very important for science to relate to the public and explain what it's doing. Sure. But um, it's something that requires perhaps a, a different way of thinking at times. 
slightly more humble way of presenting what one is doing. <laughs> that could well be. I think there are many instances where um, a little more humility and might have been desirable. I think, yeah. I think on that we would probably agree, Peter. Right. Well, thank you very much for talking to Voices from Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. It's thank been a you. pleasure to do so.